Okay, if we import something, what are we doing? Import. Let's take a stab. Emily. Oh. Okay, bringing in. So I would just like to change your B word to something different. You said bringing goods from another country, buying goods from another country, right? So yes, we're actually purchasing them from foreigners. So they come over to us and we're importing uh, Toyotas or something. And so exporting is just the opposite. It's sales of goods to other countries. So let's kind of definitionally get that down in your notes here. So exports, or wait, I started with imports, sorry. That doesn't really matter. We'll start with exports. I got the e so exports. This is the sale of goods to a foreign country. So it's the U.S. selling goods. If we want to think about the USA, here's a little known fact. The USA exports chopsticks. Did you guys know that? To China. So you know, if there's a big war with China or something, we've really got them over a barrel, they're not gonna be able to eat. Right? So we we export chopsticks to China with the wood that we got. So that's one of the things we sell to China. And for imports. This is going to be the purchases. Purchases of goods and services, goods or services, whatever, from foreign countries. USA buying plastic toys from China. Okay, and so this kind of sets the stage right away of like, oh my gosh, is uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't buy stuff from China uh, because we're losing American jobs or something, right? So that, that's kind of the path we're going down is like, uh, is this good or is it bad? And I'll just kind of cut to the chase. It's good, right? So we're gonna we're gonna learn real quick. We did a little bit at the end there uh, that it's good and that there there can be some some bad aspects to it that we might need to deal with, but overall, it's good. Uh, so Jalisa, is it Jalisa or Jalissa? I think it's Jalisa, right? Can you unmute your microphone? Jalisa going once, Jalisa going twice. I was looking for you to have your video camera on, but I thought we'd say hello. All right, she's in the bathroom or something. Okay, so, um, you know, those are the issues that we'll kind of discuss. And so from your textbook here, it just shows the fraction of gross domestic product, which is our nation's income, right? So if we add up everybody's income, about what, a number that I want you guys to keep in mind for the United States, how much is all of our income for our nation? Roughly 20 trillion. So $20 trillion, it's actually like 23 trillion, but just to kind of keep a number, just remember 20 trillion, and we'll, we're gonna get into trying to dissect that trillion dollars here next week, well, after spring break, our next uh, class week. Um, and so here, this is the fraction of imports that make up all of our income, just to think of it that way. So we have $20 trillion, 15% of our 20 trillion is what we're buying from other countries, right? So we're spending our money on Chinese plastic toys to the tune of 15% of 20 trillion. 10% of 20 trillion is two trillion, half of two is one, that's $3 trillion worth of plastic toys and other stuff that we're buying from other countries. Okay, so that's our import picture. But if we go back to 1970, it was only 5%. So it was a third of that. So $1 trillion back in 1970. So is this good or bad for the United States is one question that we'll tackle. And I'm here to tell you ahead of time, just so you have the right frame of mind, it's good. 
All right, so then over here, what's been happening with our sales to the rest of the world? So this is us selling our stuff to China, our chopsticks. And again, we see it coming in here at about 12%, somewhere in that range. It used to be a lot less. So one thing we get from this picture is that the amount of international trade has definitely grown, right? Between what we buy from other countries and what we sell to other countries, and the same thing holds true for them. So global trade has grown um, uh, probably about, this is probably about close, threefold uh, for countries around the world over time. All right, any questions or comments there? So it's certainly not insignificant, but it's not, you know, the whole enchilada either. So this next graph shows our leading trading partners uh, with the United States. So the Canadians are friends to the north and our friends to the south. Look at that, they're tied at about 15%. So 15%, and then we've got China coming in just underneath those. And so some of that you can see right away is transportation costs, right? So Mexico and Canada are right next door, and so we naturally maybe do a little bit more business with them since we have the less transportation costs. To get stuff to and from China, we got those huge container ships that are uh, massive in size, bringing lots of goods and services uh, this way. But it's still less than what we do with Canada and Mexico. And then we've got Japan, Germany, South Korea, France, India, so all kind of small. But then look at this number, all other countries outside of these countries is pretty significant, right? 34%, and that's gonna be something less than Taiwan, like less than 2% if we take all the remaining countries, which by the way is probably around 150 countries or more, 150, 160 countries, it all is pretty significant. So the point is we got our fingers and our tentacles out around the globe, right? We're really participating in international trade. And this chapter here is gonna show you why we're doing it, because it turns out to be uh, a win-win situation for both. Okay, questions or comments on that little clip? All right, so let's continue on our story here. Uh, Japan and the United States. So you guys who, if you were here, was anybody not here yesterday? Okay, you need to do some, unless you watched the recording and got it down, um, you're gonna, I'm gonna kind of blow through this fast, but it's what we did yesterday. Those of you who were here yesterday, you're gonna have this picture, it was on that side of the board before. So you, if you want to, you can redraw it, otherwise you'll just start from scratch. So, but it might be helpful for you to remember me telling you the story here. So we got the United States and Japan. And both are either producing cars or food. Cars or food. And if the Japanese threw all 1,000 of their workers at car production, they could have 25,000. Otherwise, they could have five if they threw all 1,000 workers at food production. The Americans could have 16,000 cars if they threw all 2,000 workers at car production. Otherwise, they could have 8,000 food if they threw all 2,000 workers at food production. So this gave us the production possibilities frontier for the United States, and its slope was negative two, which highlights for us the trade-off within each country. I can give up cars and get food. I, I can be anywhere along here. And so we started at four, and eight as an arbitrary starting point. We said, suppose that without any trade, we don't do anything with Japan, we just have happy little Americans making 8,000 cars and 4,000 food. And so that was our starting place with no trade. And the Japanese, they were doing three and 10. So happy little Japanese people over here making 20, 10,000 cars and consuming 10,000 cars and making 10, 3,000 food and eating 3,000 food. So that was kind of our starting place. 
The Japanese now, their trade-off was different. Their production possibilities frontier said that they could trade five cars for every one food. So the slope, by the way, ends up capturing the opportunity cost of the good uh, being measured on, let's see, is it the horizontal axis or the vertical axis? What was the cost from you guys from your notes yesterday? What was the cost of one food? What was the cost of a food in Japan? What was the cost of a food? So we did that thing where we said the opportunity cost of one food in Japan is how many cars? Go ahead, shake it up. Evan, bring it on. Five cars. Five cars. Extra credit for Evan for breaking the ice here. You guys should have some firepower. I want you guys to get lots of points since you were the ones who stuck around. And I appreciate you doing that, and I'm gonna shower you with points. But you gotta give me some love. You gotta send it back. That's all I ask. I'm a simple guy. All right, so let me just go ahead and do this attendance sheet here. As long as we're at it, so let's see. I'm gonna kinda just blow through these fast. You guys say here if you're here. Samad, Augie, Kennedy, Patrick, Will, Sienna, Chris, Ben, Jackson, Jacoby, Jay. You're here, right? All right. Yell it out if, if I say I'm your name so that I know. Uh, Drea. Drea was in personal finance for me. Unless that's a different Drea. No, that's the same Drea, I think. Uh, Anna. Here. Janaya. Caleb, Corey, Evan, Yaren, Michael Paul, Rayleigh. Here. Ian, Ariana, Andrew, Robert, here. Luke. Oh, oh, who's here? Robert? Andrew. And Andrew. Luke. Jalisa. 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 Hey, there you are. It was about time. I called you earlier and you weren't on, so. You got a camera? My camera doesn't work on this. It's old. It's not working? Okay. All right. Uh, AJ. Jerice, Emily, Javian, Kobe. No oh, Kobe, no Javian. All right. And now, extra credit pen. Coming out for Evan. All right, Evan's got on the board. All right, now we're ready to roll here. So one food, so to get one food, it costs five cars, right? So it's kind of like going from here to one, I gotta go down five. So here's the thing that uh, we didn't put on the board that you should put in your notes. It's kind of a little, um, a little helpful hint. I don't want to call it a cheat. What, what, what do you guys call it? Young kids call it again now? A hack? Oh, yeah. Is that what it is? A hack? Mental hack or something like that? Life or? hack. Huh? A life, life hack. hack. Life hack. There we go. All right. So, life hack. I know I heard my son say that once a while back. So, life hack. Here we go. Or econ. I don't know if that makes it still a life hack. I think it does, but maybe not. All right. Life hack. Um, the opportunity cost, the opportunity cost of whatever, of whatever is measured on the horizontal axis is always the slope of the production possibilities frontier. Now it's technically the negative of the slope, but I don't want to get too worked up over some math detail because this is kind of the life hack. So if we look at the US and we know that the slope is two, we know that the opportunity cost of whatever's measured on the horizontal axis, the opportunity cost of food is two. 
right? So it's like a quick thing here. It's always uh, the opportunity cost is equal to that slope. So that's kind of a good one because you might get a, a question on your homework or something that's talking about cows and, and uh, shoes or something. And so whatever is measured here, if it's actually shoes and cows and the slope is negative uh, three, now you know the opportunity cost of shoes in this country is negative, is three cows, right? So that's the quick connection. All right. So yesterday we were trying to line up what would we do, what would be a good offer for trading. So we moved production. Our first step in kind of establishing what the gains from trade are is to move production to the thing you're good at. And so who had the low cost of food? Was it the Americans or the Japanese? Who was the low cost provider of food? The US. the US, good, Emily's on the board. Expect all of you to be on the board here by the end of the day, by the end of the class. Except Emily, you're not on this list because you added late but I got you taken care of. All right, so Emily's on. So the US, so that means we're gonna shift production. Instead of making both goods to take advantage of what we're good at, we're gonna shift production from A to B. We're gonna produce all food with the hopes of then trading with the Japanese for cars. The Japanese were best at cars, so their point B star, the star remember is just telling the, which one the foreign country is, they're going to produce all cars and then they're going to exchange. And so the offer that we said is let's just assume, assume that the terms of trade, you know, I wanted to look, I didn't look on this textbook if they use world price or terms of trade, let me see. Try to be consistent with the textbook. There's a couple different names that this goes by. And I'm not seeing anything. All right, I'll have to look a little closer later. Now it looks like they're just analyzing the whole thing. World price, okay, they're using world price. So we'll try to do world price. Um, so assume, I, uh, I don't know if they use the word terms of trade and I try not to confuse it. So assume that the world, the world price, I actually like using that better, but my old textbook did not do that. So assume that the world price, uh, WP, or actually they use PW, the world price, of food is three. So it's three cars for every food. They maybe negotiated, it maybe just came about. We learned yesterday that that was a win-win situation. Let's review that, because that's huge. So the United States, if they were to want cars themselves, they would have to give up some of their food and how many cars would they be able to make on their own? Come on, stay with me people. If they did it on their own and they gave up one unit of food, how many cars would they get if they did it on their own? Two. So they get one, two. But now they're gonna buy a Toyota instead. The Japanese are offering three. Is that better for them? They could do two on their own, give up one, get one, two. Now it's give up one, one, two, three. And now we're doing better than what we could do ourselves with three. Does that work for the Japanese? If they wanted some food because they were getting hungry, they would have to give up five to get one food. Now how many do they have to give up? Shout out, people. Give it to me. Three. So down five over one. Now it's down three over one. Is that a good deal for them? Yeah. 
So it's a win-win situation for both countries. At a price of three, both are being are, are, are potentially made better off here, or are being made better off once, once we figure out where they trade to. Okay, so that then sets up the consumption possibilities frontier. So here's where our story continues. Um, let's measure the gain from trade. Let's measure the gain, the gains from trade in terms of in terms of one good or the other. So I want to see compared to where we were at before, let's do one or the other. Do you guys want to do it in terms of food or cars? You guys tell me. This is like an experiential workshop thing. Should I put the gains in terms of food or cars? Cars, I heard first. How many people say cars? All right, looks like cars have it. All right, sorry. So we got we had, we had cars, in terms of cars. So how are we gonna do that? For the US, without trade, point A shows how many food and cars they had before. So how many cars did the US have without trade? How many? And Egypt, this is the participation point again. How many? Eight. Good, Corey. So Corey's up here. Nice and good. Loud. My old rock and roll ears. I need some volume. All right. So for the U.S. without trade, remember that they're at eight cars and uh, four food. And so if we want to get back to show the gains from trade in terms of cars, what we're going to do is start trading to get back to having our four food. So let me kind of put into slow motion here the trade-offs. Let's see what I want. Oh, I the black one here. Okay. So everybody was with me, I think, when I said give up one, get one, two, three. So now what we're going to do is we're going to be able to trade for three along this line. And we're going to go back and see how many more cars we have. So this black line is the consumption possibilities frontier, the CPF. So for the US, we started with eight and four. Then, so this is kind of step one. Step number two, with trade, produce all food, which implies zero cars and 8,000 food. That's our point B. And now step number three is with trade, we're going to trade with Japan to get back to having for food, where we started. So all I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to sell some food, get some cars. Sell some food, get some cars. Sell some food, get some cars. So how much food am I ultimately selling? This is your turn to shine again. How much food am I selling to Japan? Four, right? So I'm giving up four to get back to four. It just happens to be the same number. I'm selling four to get back to having four. So when I do this, that implies I need to sell 4,000 food. And then what's the price that I get for my food? How much do I get for each food? I give them a food, I get three. So what we're gonna do now here is say, we're gonna sell a quantity of four food at a price 
of 3, and this is why I used this notation, which is a little goofy, but now it's going to come in handy, 3 cars for every food. 4 times 3 is 12. So I'm going to get 12 what? Now here, check this out. 4 times 3, so it's F times C over F, which means the F's cancel and it's 12,000 cars. And all I really did was use the slope, the slope now that I didn't put in here before, the slope of the consumption possibilities is equal to the world price, three. Three cars for every food. And so now I'm just snaking along this line and what you guys just did was figured out what that number is. What's that number? 12, well, good tonight. So that number is 12. That's what we just sold for. I sold 4,000 food at a price of three cars for every food, and now I have 12,000 cars in my possession. And then there's one last final step. I was trying to calculate the gain from trade. So step number four is, therefore, the gain from trade with Japan is equal to, what did I gain? Four, good. So I had eight when I started without any trade, and then I'm like, oh, okay, I'll try this international trade thing. Let's see what that fun is like. And then I ended up at four and 12, which means I gained four. So there's the gain of four cars. So the gain from trade was 12 cars minus the eight cars that I had without trade equals 4,000 cars. And so let's call this point, point C. So I started at A without trade, I moved my production to B, and then I traded to get to C. And at the end of the day, the United States benefited 4,000 cars. Questions on that? If you're still a little foggy, let's do Japan now. What is the Japanese situation? So, for Japan, we're just going to follow this roadmap again. For Japan, without trade, how many cars do they have? Uh, no, not 25. Without trade. No trade. They have 10. They're starting at point A. So they have 10 and 3 without trade, the no trade point. So without trade, we've got point A star, which is at 10 cars and 3 food. That's just our initial starting place. Then, what do they shift their production to? With trade. So with trade, how many cars are they going to make? 25. And how much food? Zero. Zero. So full specialization into 25. So with trade, we've got point B star, which is going to be 25,000 cars, but no food. Because they're going to rely on trade to get their food from the Americans. <laughs> All right, so the terms of trade is the same thing here. Now, where are we gonna, so let me just kind of go uh, draw in. So this thing has still a slope of three. Remember it was down three over one. So this is Japan's consumption possibilities frontier. Its slope is three because that's the deal that they made with the Americans. You can trade three cars for every food. So now, step three. Where are we going? What do we need to do? Tom, you're Japan now. You're sitting here with 25,000 cars. What do you need to do to show the gains from trade in terms of cars? The louder. Who's talking? I can't hear. Robert, was that you? All right. 
Trade the cars for food. Okay, and how much food do I need to buy? So we used to be at A at 10 and 3. Now we made all cars and we have zero food. You're absolutely right. How much do I have to buy now from the Americans? 10? 3. So we're going to get back to having three. So what I want to do is I give up uh, some, I give up three, I get one. I give up three, I get one. Where am I going? In order to term, show the gains from trade in terms of cars, I want to solve this problem. I want to get back to here. And I want to figure out that number. Okay, so we're going to sell. So for the Japanese, they're our seller now. So uh, let's see, I uh, need to buy food to get back to free food. So that implies the Japanese are going to buy three food. And what is the price of the food? What do they have to shell out to buy their food per unit? I need to buy three, or maybe it's easier for you to think, what's it going to cost me? How many cars do I have to give up to buy three food? Nine. Nine. Good. So Evan's on a double rampage here. You guys better want to hear from more. So when they go to buy food, what does the world market tell them that food costs? Three cars, maybe. Hand it over. Three cars for every food, which means it's going to cost you three times three is nine. And then nine what? This is the handiness of this. The F's cancel out. It's F over F, right? I want to make sure everybody's clear. You can always put anything over one, right? So what I'm doing with these ratios is I'm saying the F's cancel. And so at three, what? Three cars, or nine cars, rather. So nine cars. So what's this number? Sixteen. Good. Who said that? Is that Corey? All right. So it's 25 minus the nine gives us 16. So notice that it was a little different in how we approached the problem, right? Depending on if we were buying cars or selling cars. So if you thought this, oh, this seems a little different than what we did before, you're right, it is different. Because in one case we're buying, in one case we're selling, depending on what we're putting the terms of trade in for. All right, so now we got that. And so now what's the gain from trade? in terms of cars, six, 16 minus 10. Without trade, we had 10, and now we've got 16. And we've got the same amount of food. So we're good on food, and we just gained six cars. So therefore, the gain from trade is equal to 16 minus 10 equals six cars. Now I want you to put a little star in your notes, memorize, know how to do this for the final exam. Or not the final exam, the midterm exam. I'm just telling you, you're going to have a problem just like this. It's not going to be identical, but ask questions now because you will see this, I promise you. You're going to see this on the midterm. And you're going to have to work through a problem just like we're doing in class. That's the value of coming to class, is that you're already studying for the midterm. All right. Questions. Here's your challenge problem to make sure you can do it on yourself. So put it on your notes to say, uh, know how to do this for the test. Know how to do this for midterm. On your own, when you're studying, 
find the gain in terms of the other good, in terms of food. That's your challenge problem. And I'll just tell you right now, all we're doing is you need to find point D. There's nothing wrong with finding point D and D star. That is just going to do kind of exactly what we did, but you're going to show the gains from trade in terms of the other good. Right? So you're showing the gains from trade in terms of food. That'll be your challenge problem to work on. Okay, questions on the gains. All right, so this is like, woo! International trade, free trade, baby. Let's reduce poverty. How many of you people would like to see more people in poverty? Good, I'm glad you're listening that nobody accidentally raised their hand, right? World poverty has been reduced 30% over that time period from 1970s because more and more countries have embraced trading with other countries. Look, it made both countries better off. Remember that the deck was stacked in this thing. Who was better at making both things? Who had the absolute advantage? Japan did. So the Americans were the fat, lazy ones that couldn't make squat. But they just got better off with trading with the efficient, elite, super smart Japanese. This is such good news for the rest of the world. If you live in poor, rural Africa, you might have a chance of doing something on the, you, I shouldn't say you might, you can participate in international trade and make yourself better off. It doesn't matter how good the Americans are or how good the developed countries are of Japan and the United States. Every country around the world has a comparative advantage in something. I just proved it to you. The Japanese were better at making both goods, but I made the argument that, hey, Japan, you can be made better off with trading with us lowly Americans. Huge message, right? That's exciting for reducing global poverty, is to look for economic freedom in ways that we can have people engaged in the global marketplace. So this is, I mean, it's related to this chapter, but I don't want to get too sidetracked because we've got some other fun stuff to do. But what have we done with Putin and Russia recently? Jay? Uh, we stopped taking their oil. Yeah, we started ta taking their oil. oil Mickey D's, out of there. Netflix, out of there, right? So what's happening to international trade in a very fast way? It's gone. Putin's a dumbass. He just lost all of what we just did here that Putin has been able to do since the fall of the Soviet Union, or he was a part of anyway. Remember, he wasn't uh, president back when that fell, but that was 1991 was when Russia, the former USSR, broke off. Slowly but surely, people were willing to dabble, like McDonald's and Netflix and other places. They were willing to dabble. I just heard kind of an interesting piece this morning on putting a McDonald's over in Moscow. And so slowly but surely, they opened up for trade and have built up decent incomes. They still have issues. But now, with his stupidity, it's all gone. And it ain't coming back very quickly. I, I, I don't know what would have to happen for them to allow trade to go back on for a long time. There's going to have to be some serious healing. Maybe Putin gets assassinated and a new... A decent person gets put into place it's gonna take something like that like they're gonna to have to clean house Russia is new sorry for their previous Hitler ways right this was Hitler Germany right do we trade with Germany now yeah what happened Hitler's dead Nazis gone the whole place was annihilated the Americans helped build up their economy again and when they built it up they were open for trade and free markets and being more friendly and nicer to people. That unfortunately is what sometimes it takes to get things changed. And of course, you guys, if you've been listening to the news at all, the Ukraine's getting wiped out right now. And so there, this is not gonna change very fast. Putin has created a big mess for himself. Of course, not only economically with uh, this type of thing, but in many other ways. Jake. Like there's a recent thing that I, I saw in the news that uh, 
the Russians over there, they're not, they're meeting the car that lives to stop. Before yeah, the right. There's, uh, even the, and that, that's where the, he's going to feel the pressure is that they're rich uh, oligarchs who are basically get government favors from them to run their businesses and they're super billionaires. They're going to be pretty ticked off because they can't even travel around. There's no American nice things. They can't go to Morocco for and buy a yacht. Nobody's going to sell them a big fancy yacht. Lord knows the Russians probably can't build a decent yacht, right? They would always be importing that from somewhere. So some, some big problems like that that uh, I, I don't know how it's all going to shake out, but I do know this. When they traded, they lost. But who else lost? When the Americans said, Putin, we're not trading with you anymore, did we lose too? Yes. Yes. That's what I just showed you here, right? If it's a win-win when we trade, when we stop trading, it's a lose-lose. So Americans are paying the price now too for not being able to trade with them. So that's something I haven't heard brought up in the media very much, but we're starting to feel it, right? What's happened in the gas prices? They're going up. Now they were already going up for other reasons prior to the war, but that is helping them go up a little bit more now too, or making them go up a little bit more. Okay, so now let's bring this analysis into our supply and demand framework so that we can talk about uh, policy changes. And what if we have taxes on imports or restrictions on the quantities that can come in because we're trying to help somebody. So what I want to start off with was thinking about how do world prices get uh, determined? So where does the world price, PW, I guess I thought I could have did this one. Where does the world price get determined? The world price of oil. I mean, this is such a big thing now. And the answer is a market. So I'm going to draw three, leave yourself plenty of room all the way across your paper. We're going to have three graphs that are going to be connected horizontally. So three, three graphs side by side. And here we're going to put the United States. And here we're going to put, uh, let's put Canada. All right, so we have a supply and demand. So for the United States, we're going to be looking at the supply and demand of beer. So this is USA beer, American beer, and this is Canadian beer. All right, so for the United States, I want you to draw a supply and demand curve a little bit intersecting a little bit low on your graph. It doesn't really matter where it is, but a little bit low. And then for the Canadians, I want you to do a supply and demand also, but a little bit higher this time where they intersect. Doesn't matter the elasticity, so you can have them a little flat or a little steeper. It doesn't, the slope of it doesn't matter. So feel free to kind of put it wherever, wherever you draw it is just fine. You're not going to be screwing up the graph. And so all this is saying is that within each country, there's a domestic price that gets established. And so where the supply and demand curve, like we just did in the previous chapter, we have a price of beer of, um, let's say, oh, $12. So price of beer, $12. And the Canadians have a price of beer of, uh, I maybe should have gotten a little closer with my Should be good. Let's just call this eighteen dollars. I forgot that I usually do kind of uh, try to do this a little differently. I think I won't screw it up, but maybe I will. All 
All right, so each country's different, so we wouldn't expect without trade, they would have different prices of beer. But we did learn something last time. Who's got the comparative advantage in beer according to these two graphs? Who's the better beer producer, the Americans or the Canadians? Who's the better beer producer? Who would you say? So it's $12 beer in the United States, Canadians have $18 beer. The Americans, right? So it's, it's the price is lower, which means in a competitive market, the costs are lower. So the cost of production is lower in the United States as well. As long as there's lots of beer producers, we got Budweiser and Miller and you know, all kinds of craft breweries and all that. So there's lots of suppliers. So the profit that the beer companies are earning or the beer producers are earning is just a normal profit, a fair profit, right? So, and because they are better at it, the cost of production is less for the Americans relative to the Canadians. So one of our things to point out here is that since the price of beer in the USA is less than the price of beer in Canada, that implies a comparative advantage for the USA in beer. They are the low cost provider, lowest opportunity cost is with USA. All right, so in the middle here is the world market. You guys are probably wondering what's going on with the middle part. So in the world market, what price would the Americans need to get from the rest of the world to want to have incentive to sell their beer to other countries? What would they need to get at least? Because right now they're happy, by the way, selling, uh, you know, 100,000 uh, bottles of beer here at, at, this is Q1, and this is our domestic price, P1, they're all happy. What would induce them to want to sell to foreigners? What price would they need to get, at least? Would they be happy if foreigners said, oh, I'll buy your beer for $8? No, so what does it need to be at least? 12. At least 12. If, they, if, if a Canadian said, I'll give you 18, they're like, hell yeah, that sounds great, right? So anything above 12 would induce the Americans to do that. So now I want you to kind of put a dash, 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 dash at $12 in the world market. The Americans are not going to be exporting anything at 12. So what we're measuring here is the imports and exports of beer. This is the beer world market here, beer. Okay, so now here's the interesting part. Um, if they were able to get $18, and now I want you to go dash, 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 dash. If the Canadians offered 18, What amount would they give? What amount would they sell? So now let's kind of think about what does 18 mean from chapter three? Let's talk excess demand and excess supply. At a price of 18, we learned that that's not equilibrium, ignoring international trade issues. Was this excess supply or excess demand? Was it a surplus or a shortage? Surplus. So at 18, American beer manufacturers are producing this. This is the American producers. And American consumers are moving on to White Claw and whiskey. And they're like, I'm not paying $18 beer, right? So American consumers have cut back. And they're like, you want to sell it to the Canadians? I don't care. I'm not buying it. I'm going to move on to some other alcohol, right? And so this then is the surplus, or what we call the excess supply domestically. 
But now it's not functioning the same way we did in chapter 3. Because what was the story we told in chapter 3 was, oh, prices are $18, the liquor store has too much beer on their shelves, what did they do the next day? Drop price. And we move back to equilibrium. But now they're able to sell it. They're going to sell it to the Canadians. And so this excess supply now turns into the amount they're exporting. All right, now everybody watch me on this. Pull up from your screen, because this is the important part. So this amount here is a number, right? Remember when you did that, or in, I guess some of you might not have done it if you're, this is your, your first econ class. So this is a number, so if this was uh, let me just make up some numbers here. 500 and this was a 50. That's 450 cases of beer that we're going to, and probably a 12 pack of beer, I guess, at that price. But all right, here we go. We're going to move that over to the world market. So this distance here is 450. This distance is this distance, right? Because now we're talking about, well, what's going on in the world exchange, the exchange of imports and exports, and so that's the amount that would be going on. All right, so they could also be anywhere in between, and so check it out. Everybody kind of watch me this time because I'm not going to make a mess of my graph more than I am. At this price, they'd export this much. At this price, they'd export this much. At this price, this much, which means the export supply curve looks like that. So if you're eyeballing it, it's always the center section, but once you've done this endpoint and this endpoint, just draw a straight line and you'll have the graph down for the export supply. Okay, let me give you a second to catch up with that part. Everybody get this down on your paper. All right, so that's what the supply of beer looks like in the world market coming from the Americans who have the comparative advantage. Now take your bottom line, dot, 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 and at $12, we're doing the same thing for the Canadians, and so this is the excess demand or supply down here. At $12, there's excess demand, because the demand is greater than the supply. So this was excess demand. Now, what the story that we told before was that the Canadians are like, $12 beer, let's party, right? They used to be paying 18, and now they can buy $12 beer. But the Canadian producers aren't producing that amount. And so there would be a shortage or excess demand. But now you guys are starting to know the story. Where are they going to buy this extra beer from? From the Americans. All right. So now this then becomes the imports that they can do at $12. So now we go back to our graph. Now this one's a little wider. Remember, it doesn't matter if you did it narrow or wide. But what you want to do is keep it right at 12 and drift that red bar onto this graph and make a point. If the world price was $18, the Canadians aren't going to buy anything from the rest of the world, right? So they're happy in their own country at $18. And so at $18, they buy zero. Otherwise, they buy anything in between. And so the export or the import demand is my red line. Okay, questions on that? Guess what the world price is going to be? I got my extra credit pen. Somebody who hasn't spoke yet? You get first dibs? Uh, Wait, you did already, Jay. I got you down. 
Oh, I didn't have you down my line, but I'm going to put you down because you talked already. I want a new, fresh voice. What's the world price going to be? You don't have to give me an exact number. Just tell me in general, like, how would you determine what the world price is in the world market? Tonight. Wherever the demand is. Excellent. Yeah, right here. So where these two cross, let me get you down. So where the supply equals demand, but now we're just thinking about the world market. So this one looks just like we did in chapter, in the previous chapter. So where this, and you're, you're, everybody's paper would be potentially different. So, but this is PW, the world price is where the supply and demand for imports and exports interchange with each other. Now, final step is kind of an important one too. At the world price then, it's less than 18 for the Canadians, it's greater than 12 for the Americans. Now you take that, I'm running out of, oh, I need my orange, here we go. Now we've got this quantity, the quantity of exchange in the world. So this is the quantity that the world of imports and exports, this orange bar now, if you did it correctly, should fill up the space in between here. So on the world stage, this and this and this, this is almost like magic if you do it right, uh, it should be pretty close for you. If you go da 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 it's like magic. Boom, boom, boom. So what the Americans are actually exporting, this is American exports, is what the Canadians are buying the imports. Pretty cool, I think, right? I, you guys, I hope I'm opening your eyes to not only how prices get determined in the United States, but now we're talking the whole freaking world. This could be oil, this could be soybeans, this could be corn, it could be beer. Anything we trade, this is what's going on. The only thing that I'd modify that we're not gonna do for this class is that, of course, there's lots of exporters. There might have been, um, you know, maybe some uh, German beer. They're pretty good at making beer. They'd be on this side. Maybe without any trade, they would have $8 beer. So there'd be Germany and uh, France and uh, Chile. And then over here would be Canada and Venezuela and Lithuania and England. So there's lots of countries, depending on where they would be relative to the price of the world, they're either an importer or an exporter. And so now the world trade of all these imports and exports, this is how it gets determined. It's always just kind of leveling out. If something changes in the, in the world, so if the Canadians all of a sudden become uh, more thirsty and the demand shifts to the right, then they're going to start importing more, right? That's going to make this go out, and that's going to cause world prices to go up a little bit. Okay, I see a glaze over your eyes, so I better, I better stop. That's pretty much what I wanted to get you guys to anyway, so the world price. All right, so now what happens when countries have trade restrictions? So free trade has been a battle for the last 80 years. Um, Really, a lot of trading started happening more and more after the Great Depression because they realized, gosh, we could make ourselves better off if we would just open up for, for trade. And so the next thing we need to look at is trade restrictions. Kind of like what we did with Russia. Now, if you do a, a total, like, I'm not ever trading with you again anything. That's what we do with Cuba, by the way. If, if any of you are cigar smokers, uh, you can't get Cuban cigars because Cuba was playing nice with Russia back during the Cold War. And we said, sorry, we're not going to play that game. So we've already stopped trade with Cuba for many years. You guys seen pictures of the Cuba where they're driving around 1950s cars? 
Well, the reason they're driving 1950s cars is not because they like 1950s cars, it's because they can't buy an American car. They can't get new cars over there. And of course, they don't have much snow, so they don't have to worry about rust and stuff, so they can let, make them last for a while. But it's due to trade restrictions with the embargo. So now that same thing's gonna happen with Russia, is the reason I brought that up. But the two we wanna focus in for the book here is uh, tariffs and quotas. So number one is a tariff. A tariff is simply a tax on imports. So we call it a tariff because it's specifically on goods that we're importing. And what the country's probably trying to do, the intended, the intentions of it, it's intended to protect domestic producers. Intended to protect domestic producers. Back to our example here really quick. Before we opened up for trade, Canadian beer companies were getting 18 bucks for the beer. We opened up with the Americans and beer prices fell. Did they like that? No, we're taking away their business, right? So that was kind of hurting them a little bit. And so if we put a tax on American beer coming in, that'll raise the price of American beer and bring the price up. That's kind of the story that's going on relative to our picture here. So we'll, we'll just draw that piece of it for, with an example here. So here's the, here's the tariff. All we're gonna do is draw Canada And we're going to help protect the beer producers. So for the first picture, just go ahead and draw a demand and supply curve. We're kind of starting from scratch. So don't worry about uh, matching up what you did before. But at the world price, PW, we had consumption by the Canadians of this amount, let's call it 100 cases of beer, and Canadian beer makers were only making uh, 20 of it. So they were importing 80 units. I'm not going to write that in this time because I want to show you what the tariff does. Remember, this, this price doesn't really matter for international trade. That's like with the, if there was no trade. So we're kind of starting off with, there's the world market. That's what it looks like for Canadian beer. Canadian producers are making 20, and Canadian consumers are buying 100, 20 of which are made by Canadians, and 80 from Americans. So with the tariff, we're going to charge a... Uh, let's go ahead and put a number on PW here. So let's say this is a uh, $10 Just to keep the numbers different from there and we're gonna put a $2 tax on it. So with a $2 tax PW plus the tariff equals 12 So assume a Tariff equal to $2 per unit that's our tax. So when that American beer comes into my country, the Americans have to pay two bucks to get it over across my border. So now when that happens, it's gonna raise the price of beer in Canada by that $2. And so now Canadian consumers are going to buy less beer. Maybe they drop down to uh, 85. Now that Canada, Canadian producers, they don't have to pay the tariff, it's only the Americans that have to pay it, but they still have prices that go up. And so now they're selling uh, 35. And so the tariff has reduced the amount of imports. Imports with the tariff. versus the 80, the 
this is imports without the tariff. Okay, questions on that one? So the result of the tariff is that it helps the beer producers of Canada, but it hurts beer consumers because prices went up. Whenever prices go up, it hurts somebody and helps the other person. The, the, helps either the producers or the sellers and then hurts the other consumers. All right, good on that one? Good for now? All right, good. You guys are doing good. Quota. A quota is a legal restriction on the quantity of imports. So we're going to go back to our free market scenario. So now with the beer market, Canadian beer we have a world price we're just going to do what we did before here with 10 use the same numbers under a free market we were importing 100 just like we were doing over here all I'm going to do is change the policy instrument So what if I change it to saying you can only import 50? So let's say that the quantity restriction, the quota equals 50 units. We were importing 80, but now the government said, sorry suckers, you can only do 50. So there was the amount of imports before of 80, and now we're gonna shrink it down to 50. And so by doing that, we kind of put a hard stop of, we can only take 50 American beers. So that is the quantity of 50. And so the rest of the beer would need to come from the Canadians. If we stop at 50, so now we have 20 plus 50 is 70, we have a shortage again, right? So at the world price, consumers want to buy 100, uh, Canadian consumers want to buy 100, but there's only 70 out there. What's going to happen to the price of beer within Canadian, the Canadian border? What's going to happen if we only have, people want to buy 100, but there's only 70 out there? It's going to go up, right? So we're right back to the old story. So this number would be 70. And so what's going to happen here is price is going to go up and the supply with the quota ends up looking like this and the prices rise to 50. And so this is the price uh, with the quota, PQ. So the price is gonna rise by that amount. Now, there's a big difference here between this one and this one. With the tariff, it's a tax. Who gets your money when they hit you guys with taxes? Who gets the money? The government gets it, right? So here, with this one, notice that this rectangle is the amount of the imports with the tariff times the two bucks. So two bucks times the quantity of tariffs gives you this green box, and that is the tax revenue. 
for the government. The government's going to collect some money off this one. With a quota, with a quota, we kind of have a similar thing, but who actually got that extra money? We could kind of do a similar analysis that the quota was by the same amount. Notice that I had 50. I intentionally chose this to be equal, by the way, but 50 was that amount. So these pictures actually look kind of similar, but there's no government collecting money with this one. Who got the benefit of them imposing a quota instead of a tariff? Who got the benefit? We have Canadian uh, producers. They're now getting PQ, but actually PQ is the same as this. They don't have to pay the tariff, so they're still getting $12. Right? So this was 12 and this was 10. So it's not the Canadian producers, but the Americans. So if you're an American beer, if you're Budweiser, who's by the way owned kind of foreign, everything's kind of international now, but if you're the American beer producer, you would rather have them do the quota than this one, because now, yes, you're selling less than what you were before, but you're getting the extra two bucks because prices are gonna naturally rise in Canada, and now when you sell the Canadians your American beer, you're gonna get two bucks more. It's not gonna be siphoned off by the government like this tariff. All right, um, so I know I only got a minute left, and I know you guys are tired and wanna to get to spring break. So I'm just, I just wanna tell you one thing that's in the book. That, that's not anything big, so it's really just kind of a, a thing like this is people cry about international trade. You're taking our jobs. We have an industry that might have a comparative advantage. So there's, these are kind of the, uh, the cries that we have for international trade. And so why do people complain about trade? Well, as we learn here, when you open up for trade, prices change. In America, prices went up, which the beer producers liked, right? The beer producers liked but consumers now got hurt. In Canada, prices went down, which their Canadian producers don't like, but the beer consumers liked. And so within each country, there's always winners and losers from trade. But what we learned from our first analysis is that the winner's wins are bigger than the loser's losses. That's how we get a win-win situation overall. All right, with that, have a good break. We'll see you in a little over a week.